God bless you all. Um, this has been an incredible season uh, over the last year as God has put us in this role as district supervisors. Uh, my wife and myself and a great team that we have, including your pastor, who's one of our area pastors. Uh, and so I was really intentional that uh, I wanted to be in this part of our district because this is one section that I haven't personally been to. And so when Pastor Durant and I were talking, we said, what a, what a great opportunity because even your message series about diving deeper, he told me the story about when he was looking uh, online for like images or something like that. He happened to come up, the very first thing was a series that we had done at our, the church I was pastoring um, so several years ago. And so he called and said, let's figure this out, let's do this, and here we are. And so what an honor. Thank you for your warm welcome. We had a great cookout last night talking about food. I mean, the, I mean, I think that's one of the things about our churches, the Foursquare Church, is we know how to eat food, right? So um, thank you for your hospitality. It's great to be with you. Um, I really do believe the Lord has given me a word for you. I was planning on doing something else and a message that the Lord, maybe I'll even preach that some point in the future, but uh, when I was praying about specifically about this church and about what God is doing in your lives, you know, I don't know many of you, but the Holy Spirit knows every single one of you, and he deposited a word in my life, in, in, in my heart for you regarding an offering that we give to him and how many times that offering is painful. Anyone know what I mean? Some of you are walking through pain right now. Others are, of you are doing everything you can to avoid pain right now. Uh, I'm, I do not have a high pain tolerance. Can I admit that to you? My wife, on the other hand, has a very high pain tolerance. We have three children, which proves that she has a high pain tolerance. Uh, and uh, our kids are um, grown now. A little bit about our family. My oldest son is 24 years old. He lives in Los Angeles, right over across the street, really, from Angeles Temple. Uh, he, is, um, uh, uh, he does freelance film. He makes films and works for different um, producers and so he's our oldest. Our middle son is 22, and he just actually moved home uh, with us. He graduated from Oral Roberts University with a degree in marketing and just moved home uh, to Maryland, which is all new to all of us because we, we had uh, previously lived in New Hampshire for 18 years. So I'm kind of a New Englander. After 15 years, they say you can actually call yourself a New Englander. So I'm a New Englander, although I'm not a New England Patriots fan. Okay. In fact, let me just guarantee that this, this leather will not be deflated today, okay? <laughs> but I am a Miami Dolphins fan, which is the other side of the story because I grew up in Miami, and so sorry about that. What, what is, what's your team out here? Patriots. You got, you, that's right. Well, the closest one would be what? Short, really? That's closer than Charlotte? Okay. All right. Carolina? All right. Well, whatever. Anyway, I'm not a patriot. So then I have, we have our youngest, who's 19 years old, our daughter. And, um, but Lisa, my wife, and I have talked often about the whole idea of pain. And she has this expression, and it all comes from having three children. And she says there's such a thing as a good pain. It's a good pain. And uh, I can't totally relate to that. The most pain I've ever been in was when I had a kidney stone. And that was not a good pain. That was a really bad pain. Now, when you have something that's produced out of the pain that is good, yes, you can kind of think that, Lord, you're doing something good through this. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. The whole idea of the pain that's in the offering that we bring to Jesus, and specifically for those of you that are walking through a time of pain right now, maybe it could be loss, maybe it could be things that you're kind of uh, unexpected things that have come your way, maybe it's just because you're facing uncertainty and you're like the, you're the type of person that likes to have everything lined up, and so it's painful. 
So as I was thinking about your series, I was telling your pastor just a couple of weeks ago, uh, my wife and I went on vacation with another couple. We were offered this house that friends of ours have in the Bahamas. So it didn't cost us anything other than getting there. But when we got there, it wasn't like on the main island of the Bahamas. It was off this little island called Long Island. In fact, uh, the airport is called Dead Man's K. So we didn't know what to expect. But it was, it was a really small island, not a lot happening there. It was, it was the season where people weren't there. There weren't a lot of restaurants open, but the, the, the place was beautiful. The beach was incredible. And we were only like two miles away from this place called Dean's Blue Hole. Now, if you don't know what a blue hole is, a blue hole is a sinkhole that is often found in the, in the ocean or in bodies of water, and it just goes down deep forever. In fact, Dean's Blue Hole is the deepest blue hole in all of the world. It's over 600 feet deep, 650 uh, feet deep. So you see the sandy beach, and then all of a sudden you see truly a blue hole. And I had the opportunity to, to put on my... Um, my mask and, and my snorkel, and I snorkeled around it, and you could see how deep it goes. And, and there's also these cliffs, so I said, you know what, it's probably pretty safe to jump off into 650 feet of water, and so I did that. And I got it on video, because I probably will never do it again. Uh, and, and I was thinking about this, this whole idea about going deeper, and how do we go deeper? And the key to going deeper in our own life is to continually present ourselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice. That's really where His power comes in and overcomes our weakness. So this morning, I want to talk to you about something that we don't like to talk about, but before I do, a couple of questions. What are the times in your life that you have grown the most? Think about that. And yet, the answer that you probably give can follow up with this question, what are the times in our life that we tend to avoid the most? It has to do with pressure and pain, difficulty, right? If, if you think back in your life, you say, I grew the most when I was going through something that was really tough. Why? Because I couldn't do it on my own. <laughs> and I needed others in my life, and I needed the Lord to come through. It causes us to become reliant or dependent upon him whenever we're facing something we either try to do it on our own strength and fail and our knees buckle or we look up and we say god it's only you this morning i was reading about daniel and you know how he was faced with this incredible challenge because they he was he was being cast as one who wasn't uh, honoring the king at the time and what was his first response? He did what he would always do. He went to his upper room, got on his knees, and he prayed, and he sought the Lord. He understood that the secret when you go through different difficulty is to turn to God. And that's what happens in all of our lives. When we're going through something, that we turn to God. And yet it's the times that we tend to avoid. We don't want the pain. We want things easy, smooth sailing. But Jesus didn't call us to that kind of a life, did he? When he said, come follow me, he said, this is going to be tough. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere. Come and follow me. Or, hey, I'm going to send you out as sheep among wolves. Anyone want to volunteer for that one? Well, if you're following Jesus, that's what you volunteered for. I'm going to do it. See, we have it backwards. The American Christianity, at least a lot of Americans that I know that are Christians, it's like, Jesus, follow me. This is where I want to do. This is what I want to do. I want it easy. Could you come here and bless me? But biblical Christianity is following Jesus into the difficult places because that's where he shapes us. That's where he uses us. That's where we shine different from those who are not followers of Christ. And God is calling us to offer ourselves, even though there is pain in the offering. I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 20. And, and you probably have read this parable before, but 
I, I believe that God is going to show us something a little bit different as we break open his word and we hear what he has to say. In fact, Lord, we pray even now that you will show us through your word how you are shaping us, how you are making us, and Lord, how much you love us. We pray this in your name. In, in Luke chapter 20, uh, we're going to read from verse 9 on. He, went, he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went to another country for a long while. And when the time came, he sent uh, a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat him and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. And then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, Surely not. Surely not. Now, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees at the time, people who we know as being very religious on the outside, but in, on the inside, they were kind of, he says they were filled with dead man's bones or they were whitewashed on the outside. And he speaks this parable to them. And even the Pharisees say, this is not right. Surely not. How many of us have ever responded like that when we hear about an injustice? Right? I mean, look at all around us. We see things that are happening. The refugee crisis that's taking place in, in Syria and in, in, in Europe. And, and we say, this is not right. Maybe it's a, an injustice in your own life and you just say, surely not. God, this is not right. Maybe it's the plight of the middle class in our nation, right? We say, this isn't right. Could be someone you know personally who was treated unfairly. Maybe they even went to a, um, a mediation or a trial or went through a difficulty, and you say, this is not right. Recently, one of the churches in our district, uh, in actually in New England, they are starting another campus of their church. And and so they went to the town hall, to the planning committee, and New England is notorious for having small town politics, and they went to the small town, and they were going to buy this building. God had blessed them so they could do it, and they had this incredible offer, and they stood in front of the planning board, and they said, no, you can't do it. We're going to turn you down. And the reasoning was because it's not a hardship to you. You can find another place. Well, really, the reasoning was that they were going to lose tax money on this building. And when I heard this, I said, surely not. This is not right. Because this church already is a blessing to that community, and they will only continue to do that. But there is something in all of us, don't we admit it, that we see justice, and we want justice, and when, and when it doesn't happen, we personally get upset about it. Our first response is how unfair. So these Pharisees who Jesus was telling the parable to, they began to feel sorry for the vineyard owner and for his son. But they failed to do something that we also failed to do, and that is put ourselves into the story. Because think about it. If you were the ones who for a long time were keeping that vineyard, and the fruit of that vineyard was flowing out that it was a blessing to the master and everyone else, wouldn't your response be, well, wait a second, he's coming back now and he expects, you know, after all that we've done, this doesn't seem right. I mean, really, put yourself, even though you don't own it, you were there for a long time. And so when we turn the story around, the Pharisees failed to see that they were not the ones on the outside saying surely not, but they literally were the ones who were the keepers of the vineyard, who God had entrusted something to them. 
And then he looks at them, says in verse 17, directly and says, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then went on to say, Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. But when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Why was it so difficult for the tenants to let the owner come back and take claim to what was rightfully his? Why is it so difficult for us to let go of those things when it means pain in our life? Why is it difficult for us to walk a path that is not comfortable? We're just, we are creatures of comfort. We want to have it as comfortable as possible, don't we? Well, I think part of it is because they were doing this for this for a long time. They had worked hard for it, and they were fruitful. But as we all need to see, just like in Jesus' conclusion, his application to the parable, the way to possess what God has for us in the long run is not to hold on with what he's blessed us with, or even to hold on to our own life because the one who is willing to lose his life for Christ is the one who will save it. The way to your personal fulfillment of the promises that God has for you is not to hang on to those things and to determine what they're going to look like, but to constantly offer them back to the Lord, even though there is pain in the offering. Those that were hearing this knew Jesus wasn't just speaking about a building with the cornerstone on it or underneath it, but that he was speaking about himself. He was speaking about what it is to truly die to yourself and rebuild your life upon the solid rock that will never fail. One other time, Jesus gave a parable about uh, the foundation, and he talked about how some would build their lives on sand and The storms come and the wind comes and great is the fall of that house because you can't build on sand, right? I mean, you guys are close to the beach here. You know what happens when the storm comes in. Those things which are not anchored, are not strong, will be destroyed. When we lived in New Hampshire, when there was a a nor'easter that came by, you can be sure that the, the, the homes that were not on shore footings close to the ocean wouldn't be standing anymore. But then Jesus says in the rest of that parable, you build your house on the rock, and it will stand. But he also says this in that parable, even if your house is on the rock, the storms are going to come. The wind is going to come. The difficulty is going to face you. But great is that house that is built upon the rock. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And he's saying to the to the Pharisees and everyone that's listening to him, what you're seeing is you're seeing some people who are building their lives on comfort and on what they have and what they think they deserve. But I want you to see the difference. The difference is you build your life on a faith walk with me. You trust in me, even through the storms, even through the difficulties. Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. It was about a reject for many of these people. It was an understanding that this was about rejecting God and accepting self instead. About how it's so easy to become comfortable doing work for God, but yet forgetting to be with God. Because really, they were doing this work for their master, and they forgot. Well, wait a second. This isn't even ours. (laughs) We're doing stuff for the Lord, but wait a second. It's about the Lord, not about us. Perhaps most of all. It's really about, as we said, missing the very foundation of our lives because we tend to prop ourselves up in our own strength. A year ago, the Lord was speaking to my wife and I, and I shared with some of your leaders, after pastoring a church for 18 years in New Hampshire, planting the church, seeing it grow, seeing incredible leaders, planting other churches, starting campuses in a place in the United States where there's not a lot of church growth, not a lot of followers of Jesus. In in New Hampshire, 4% of the population go to church. And that includes every church out there. Not four square churches, not Christian churches, just church, 4%. 
And, and God called us there 18, 19 years ago now and said, I'm calling you to plant a church here, to build relationships with people, to share your life with them. One of, the, one of my favorite stories is we, we moved into this neighborhood and the Lord spoke to us and said, you're going to be the pastor of this neighborhood. We didn't know people. In fact, there weren't any people there at the time because we were the first house in the development. And God said, there's going to be others that are going to come in, homes that are going to be built up, and you are going to be their pastor, and they won't even know it yet. And so we took it upon ourselves that every time we saw a house being built, Lisa and I would walk over to that lot. We would walk around the foundation where they were building it. We would be praying that the right people would come and that God would give us a, a, an influence in their life that we'd be able to serve them. And sure enough, houses started to be built. And I remember one uh, uh, Saturday, we had pulled our, our team, our small group together, and we said, we're going to go in our neighborhood door to door, and we were going to share the love of Jesus with them. Now, you got to remember, New England is different than anywhere else in the United States. It really is. I mean, every area has its own culture, but New Englanders are known to be very standoffish. We, we think we have everything right. That's why you see it happening with the Patriots right now, right? <laughs> I mean, we have a mentality of don't mess with us. You know, we keep to ourselves. Now, when you build relationships, they're lifelong relationships, but there's a lot of barriers to jump through, to get through. And so we knocked on the door of this one family up the hill, the Johnsons, Brian and Karen, who are the parents, and uh, Kevin and Sean, the two boys, who their boys were about our boys' age, so we kind of had, you know, looking, looking ahead, thinking, well, do we? We, this would be a good relationship and knocked on the door and Brian answered and I said hey you know I'm Peter we live down the, just down the way there that's our house down there and we just came and we're just offering to pray with anyone in the neighborhood because you know we're pastors and we're just we believe that God has called us here to, to be a blessing and to share Jesus's love with you and I remember the look on Brian's face after that it wasn't near as nice as the guy that she met at the library Brian looked at me and said, we're not interested. In fact, I really don't want to talk to you about this now or ever again. So please do not bring it up again. And I was like, I probably turned white as a ghost. I was like, wow. I mean, we were just trying to bring the love of Jesus. And I didn't know what to say at that time. But we just kind of took it in stride and we kept praying for them. Kept praying. So there was pain in that for us to give of ourselves, but we continued to pray, continued to seek the Lord. Well, over the course of several years, our kids got to know each other. We actually spent time with Brian and Karen in like cookouts that the neighborhood had and all kinds of stuff like that. And, and then Karen started to get interested in what was happening at our house because we had a small group there. So she would come to the small group and she wasn't yet a follower of Jesus. In fact, she was really struggling with depression. She would ask people to pray for her and over the course of about a year, she gave her life to Jesus. Brian, on the other hand, was still not interested. But then Karen had this idea because our small group was growing now. This was the early stages of our church. And Karen said, well, if we're gonna multiply, we're gonna start another cell group small group how about if we use up my house and I'm like really you think Brian would be into that <laughs> she said well I can ask him Brian said that's fine you know because he began to see a change in his wife's life Karen's life so we then started meeting and now Brian would sit at like around the corner when we were having our small group but I could tell he was listening in he would want to hear what was going on and he would always hang out for the food right well, it turned out that, that Brian had been struggling with alcohol, major problems, drinking, keeping it hidden. Then he got picked up a couple of times for DUI, and he reached out to me. And we started to meet on a regular basis and pray. And I just want to kind of fast forward for till today because Brian is one of my closest friends. Not only has he given his life to the Lord, 
but they are both leaders in the church. Karen runs a, um, uh, um, I can't remember the name of the program, the one that's out of um, Rick Warren's church. Uh, recovery, yeah, Celebrate Recovery Group. Brian is a leader in AA that meets at the church. And together, both of them are serving Jesus. And I think about how difficult it was, though, because there were times when we were planting that church and we said, Lord, you called us to this. We started to question, did you really call us to this? Because this hurts. This isn't as easy as we wanted it to be. When, when, when we knew God was calling us to plant a church, we prayed, Lord, yes, we'll do it. Just don't send us to New England. And Jesus said, no, that's where you're going. And there was pain in the offering. It was a time where we had to say yes Nevertheless, your will be done and not mine. That was a season of breaking for us. And then recently, when God called us to finish up pastoring and become district supervisors, that was another season of letting go, of giving, because we probably felt like those guys in the vineyard. We've been doing this a long time, Lord. We're seeing the fruit finally. We're starting another campus. The community is, is being reached. And now the Lord says, okay, I'm coming back back are you going to give it to me and we had to say yes I mean we could have said no a lot of us do don't we when God calls us to something painful but we knew that to be obedient to him and to really get his best we had to say yes that was a season and is a season we're still in this season of breaking which is where the scripture says everyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. But when the stone falls on anyone, they'll be crushed. This is the contrast here. Falling on the stone or having the stone fall on us. It's the contrast of offering ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, placing ourself on the altar, or doing it our way. Doing it our way. In the Old Testament, there's a picture of sacrifice that involved lambs and oxen and other animals. And there were also pictures of altars that were made. Some of them were made out in the wilderness, and they were made of stone. And often the sacrifice was cut up, broken into pieces, and offered to the Lord as a fragrant offering. That's what God has called our lives to be. You say, well, that sounds painful. That sounds like, you know, if we, if we are broken into pieces, what will happen to us? But God doesn't just break us into pieces and leave us there. He begins to reshape who we are. We're like the clay that's on the wheel of the potter. And he sees something and he has the right to remake and to reshape us. Altars represent the occasion and the place where we have a personal encounter with God. Right? You called it, we call this the altar. Hey, come to the altar. Why? So you can have an experience with the Lord personally. Or we can make this altar in our own home, around, on our knees, around our living room, or wherever, or out. If we go take a walk, we can make that an altar. It's a place where we have a personal encounter with God. If you know the story about Jacob in Genesis 28, after going through a personal crisis, the next day, he builds an altar at that place. He builds this altar and he pours out oil, but the only thing is he still hasn't learned to offer himself on that altar. He made a promise to God that was contingent upon God doing it his way. Listen to what he says. It's found in Genesis 28, 20. Jacob makes a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Wow, what kind of vow is that? God, if you do it my way, <laughs> right? If you do it my way, and he says, and this stone which I've set up for a pillar, this altar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I'll give a full tenth to you. God was looking for more than a tenth at that point. He was looking for all of him. It isn't for another 14 years after going through some heartache. First Leah, then Rachel, 
Laban and all the nonsense that happens, continuing to scheme and do things on his own, then being reunited with his brother Esau. When he sees him, I can imagine Jacob is having some regrets about what he did there. But then a new altar is built, a place of brokenness that occurs. He wrestles with God, the scripture says. And as he's wrestling with God, God breaks him. His hip is out of place. And he changes his name from Jacob to Israel. From that moment on, he always walks with the limp of brokenness. There is pain in the offering. There is pain in the offering. However, if we're willing to release ourselves. See, the offering has to do with places in our life where we may refuse to let go. That's what the offering has to do. So think about it in your life today. Are there places where it's hard for you to truly let go? Places where comfort becomes our idol. Places where God calls us to go and those things are ignored because we've been at this a long time and it's not convenient to do anything other than this or places that we don't identify, the pain is God getting our attention because he wants us to know that he's with us and that it's in our weakness, in our weakness, that he's made strong. There is pain in the offering. Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do you notice the, the thing that's different about this kind of sacrifice and the sacrifices in the Old Testament? You see, those sacrifices were, they put them on the altar and they killed them. But Jesus is saying to us, the word of God is saying to us, that we present ourselves on the altar as a living sacrifice. The problem with a living sacrifice is it always wants to get up and leave the altar. But that's why he says this is something we do every day. This is how the message puts it. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. One of my favorite little books, if you haven't ever read it, it's by Brother Lawrence. It's about practicing the presence of God. It's understanding in every moment of our life that it can be an altar and we can be an offering. This is what it means to fall on the rock. It's when our brokenness literally becomes wholeness. To fall means to get off of the high place, go to a low place, and to bow down. And as we present ourselves to God, as we surrender to him and who he is and what his will is for us. Not an easy, not a comfortable thing, but there is something amazing that happens. Have you ever felt that the Lord put, a, put something in your heart, an expectation, a promise? Something that, you know, it was like God has given you this hope, right? And you begin to look at that promise and picture in your mind what it's going to be like. But the fact is, the way we often visualize what that promise is is a lot different than what God's plan is. It's like someone was saying, he shows us one step in front of the other because if he showed us at all, it would just blow our minds. When my kids were little, they would come up to me... Um, during after school time or when I came home and they would run to me. I remember my daughter doing this all the time. She would run to me and she said, Daddy, I made a picture for you. And I'd look at the picture and I'd be like, what is it? You know? She said, Daddy, that's the house and see the fireplace and the smoke coming out and that's our little doggy and oh, oh. I say, wow, that is really cute. <laughs> that is really cute. I think that's what we do to God. Give him our little cute little picture. This is what I want it to be like. And God's like, what is it? <laughs> or, it's cute. But then he says, but let me show you the plan that I have for you. If you just.
just surrender that. And he like turns our attention to this huge panorama, this incredible masterpiece. He says, do you, do you want that? Or I've got so much for you. But you've got to be willing to offer yourself fully to me. Be encouraged. Because the promises that he gives you, you can embrace them right where you are today. Even if, it's, even if it seems different than what you hoped for. The Lord is with you. He can make it work, but it's going to require the building of an altar on your part. And saying, I'm willing. And then trusting God that his vision for your life is greater than you can imagine. One of the things that, that I've been guilty of is sometimes I will buy gifts for people and it's not something that they really want. Anyone ever do that? Husbands, you ever do that for your wives? <laughs> so I remember like three Christmas, four Christmases ago, I was so excited about this gift I got from my wife. And, and I wrapped it up and you know, I told the kids about it. I said, we got to keep this. She's going to love this. This is an incredible gift. And you know what it was? It was a rice maker. And the reason I thought it would be such a great gift is my wife loves rice. She's, she does all kinds of dishes with rice. And, you know, it's a lot of times when she would cook the rice without the rice maker, it would be like rice potatoes, you know, mashed potato rice. I thought, she's going to love this because this is going to make the rice so good. And she, so I told her, you're going to love this. And she opened that gift on Christmas, and she probably thought it was going to be a Louis Vuitton purse or something. <laughs> and it was a rice maker. And she was like, okay. <laughs> I think that's the kind of things that we often do to God, just our version of the gift instead of fully all ourselves. This reminds me of the story of the, the three brothers who were celebrating their mother's 90th birthday. And they all wanted to get her a really, really special gift. <laughs> so the, 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 they lived in New York City, and so the first brother said, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to upgrade her, her apartment so she is now going to be living in a penthouse for the rest of her life. He made the, put the deposit down, and he did all that, and, and sure enough, he presented it to his mother on her birthday. Now, the second son thought, well, you know, she lives in New York City. It's hard to get around, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy her a limousine and hire a chauffeur for the rest of her life, and she will be able to get around town so easily. It will be so convenient for her. She's going to be so blessed by it. The third son said, well, you know, because they were all Christians, and he said, well, I know how much mom loves the word of God. And so what I'm going to do, and he spent like a year planning this out, he bought this parrot that could quote scripture and verse. In fact, he had it trained by the theologians, and sure enough, you know, it would you just say the verse, and it would quote, and she said, this would be great for mom. She loves the word of God, and this would be such a blessing for her the rest of her life. And he presented all the gifts, and of course, mom was so overwhelmed and happy, well, about three months come go by and they had a they they got together and they said mom we want to know what do you think about the gifts we got you and she said to her first son marvin marvin you know this penthouse it's beautiful but it's just me here i mean i was okay where i was and i know your heart in this and so i thank you so much but honestly it's way too much for me she said to her second son michael michael that uh you know i I don't get her out that much, and when I do, I just go around the corner, and you know, that the limousine is so kind of, you know, it, it's not who I am, and by the way, the limo driver is really rude half the time, but I know your heart in it, and I am grateful for it. And then she went to her last son, Jeffrey, and she said, Jeffrey, let me tell you, your gift was the best of all. That chicken was delicious. Isn't it true that there are times where we have an impression of what God wants, just like Jacob did, and really what he wants is us. 
just to give ourselves to him. There is pain in that kind of offering. In Luke chapter 1, Mary said, after the angel shows up, what did, he, what did she say? Let it be done according to your word. There was pain in that. I mean, she was planning her life. She was getting engaged. She was going to have a family. She was all of that. And she said, what your will is, Lord, I'll do. There was pain in that offering. David, remember when the men brought him water, they broke through the enemy line, and, and he took that water. Instead of drinking it, he poured it out to God. He says, I won't give to God what costs me nothing, that I'm not going to, I'm going to give this to the Lord. He poured himself out. So how do we do that? How do we present ourselves as an offering? Well, today, some of you are in a painful place, perhaps. Maybe you've experienced loss, and you just don't know how to put the pieces back together. Offer yourself to the Lord in that place. Others, maybe you're in a place where you don't want to let go because it's going to be too painful. What you're doing, where you live, what you have, don't let that become your identity. Release yourself to Jesus because it's only when we fall on the rock that our lives will be rebuilt and then rebuilt again and then again. And how many of you know we have to be constantly rebuilt, which is why we present ourselves daily to the Lord. C.S. Lewis says this in closing. He says, imagine yourself as a living house, and God comes in to rebuild that house. Any, any contractors here that do rebuilds, you know, there's a lot of work going into that, right? So God is coming, and he's rebuilding that house, and that's you. And and, and, and at first, you can understand what he's doing because, you know, there are things that are not right. You know, the drains need to be replaced and the leaks in the roof. He says, you know that those jobs needed to be done. And so you're not surprised. There's a little tinkering around, and it's a little painful. And it's like, okay, God, you're doing that. You're getting it right. But then he starts to knock about the house in a way that hurts so much, and it doesn't seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? Here's the explanation. He's building quite a different house from the one you thought. He's throwing on a new wing here, putting an extra floor in there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a little cottage, but he's building a palace, and he intends to come and live in it himself. Imagine if we lived our life by following his lead not holding on to what we have, not holding on to who we are, but truly emptying ourselves. Because then what happens, Romans 12, 1 says we present ourselves. Romans 12, 2 says we don't conform to the world, but we're transformed by offering ourselves to God, and we become holy, which is not to mean that we are perfect, but it means that we are holy and acceptable to God, and it means that the world looks on us and sees us as distinctly different, holy. There is pain in the offering. And so my question to you, to me, to all of us, is are we willing to turn over who we are, what we have, our little drawing, our little cute little sketch, say, Lord, take all of it. I'm willing to fall upon the rock and be broken knowing that your plans and dreams are better, that you are the comforter, and Lord, that all that we have, you gave to us in the first place. I'd like to pray with you right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, it is hard to separate ourselves as followers of Christ from the culture that we live in culture is all about me, what I can get. It's a culture that is built around comfort, the next thing, what we have defining that defines us. And yet, Lord, right in this room, we are followers of Christ. Right here, Lord Jesus, we are called to be holy, distinctly different. And I pray, Lord, for those that are here that are in pain. In fact, if you, 
if you would be so bold as to say, right now I'm in a place of pain, and I've done everything I can to try on my own strength to get out of it, but maybe what God is calling you to is to just surrender to him even in that pain and to look to him. If you're here and, and that's you, would you just lift your hand? If you're in a place of pain right now, mm. yeah, yeah, yes. Father, I pray for those who raise their hands that are facing pain, Lord God. It could be physical pain. It could be a pain in the, uh, the aspect of loss that they've experienced. Disappointment. Even something dealing with an internal identity thing, Lord, in them. Pain. Jesus, give them the courage right now to know that you are their cornerstone, that you are their rock, and that they will lay themselves, fall upon the rock, even in their pain, offering themselves to you as a fragrant offering, Lord Jesus, that is holy and acceptable to you, and that as they do, Lord Jesus, you will put the pieces back together, not according to their will, not according to their plans, but according to your best. We pray for them now in Jesus' name that this would be, uh, this would be done, Lord God, and they would walk this out in Jesus' name. Now I want to ask those of you that are here that you may say, I am one who does everything I can to avoid pain. I, I, I'm, I'm, it's difficult for me to let go. It's different, difficult for me to surrender. It's difficult for me to face something that is uncomfortable. And yet you know this morning from the word, the Lord is calling you to be able to lay yourself down, even if it's painful, even if it's difficult, because you know that he loves you and he wants so much more for you. If that's you, could you raise your hand wherever you are? Yeah. Yes. Lord Jesus, for those whose hands are up, God, and, and I would raise my hand too because I do not like having to face the uncertainty, the pressure, all of those things. I will do everything I can, Lord, to run the other way. But yet, Lord Jesus, it's like, it's like you yourself prayed. If there is any other way, Lord, but nevertheless, let your will be done. And so for those whose hands are raised, that, Lord, we will understand there is pain in the offering, but there is something beautiful that happens when we wrestle with you. You change our name. We may walk with a limp, but that is distinguishable that we met with God. And so, Father, help us, Lord, to walk in such a way that our lives are an offering to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pastor. Pastor.